It was in the township of Dunwich, in a large and partly inhabited farmhouse set against a hillside four miles from the village and a mile and a half from any other dwelling, that Wilbur Whateley was born at 5 a.m. on Sunday the 2nd of February 1913. The mother was one of the decadent Whateleys, a somewhat deformed, unattractive albino woman of 35, living with an aged and half-insane father about whom the most frightful tales of wizardry had been whispered in his youth. Lavinia Waitley had no known husband, but according to the custom of the region made no attempt to disavow the child, concerning the other side of whose ancestry the country folk might, and did, speculate as widely as they chose. On the contrary, she seemed strangely proud of the dark, goatish-looking infant who formed such a contrast to her own sickly and pink-eyed albinism, and was heard to mutter many curious prophecies about its unusual powers and tremendous future. There was a hideous screaming which echoed above even the hill noises and the dogs barking on the night Wilbur was born, but no known doctor or midwife presided at his coming. Neighbours knew nothing of him until a week afterward, when old Waitley drove his sleigh through the snow into Dunwich village, and discoursed incoherently to the group of loungers at Osborne's general store. There seemed to be a change in the old man, an added element of furtiveness in the clouded brain which subtly transformed him from an object to a subject of fear, though he was not one to be perturbed by any common family event. Amidst it all he showed some trace of the pride, later noticed in his daughter, and what he said of the child's paternity was remembered by many of his hearers years afterward. Let me tell you something. Some day you folks will hear a child of Lavinia's calling its father's name on the top of Sentinel Hill. The only persons who saw Wilbur during the first month of his life were old Zechariah Waitley, of the undecayed Waitleys, and Earl Sawyer's common-law wife, Mamie Bishop. Mamie's visit was frankly one of curiosity, and her subsequent tales did justice to her observations. But Zechariah came to lead a pair of Alderney cows which old Waitley had bought of his son Curtis. This marked the beginning of a course of cattle buying on the part of small Wilbur's family, which ended only in 1928 when the Dunwich horror came and went. Wilbur's growth was phenomenal, for within three months of his birth he had attained a size and muscular power not usually found in infants under a full year of age. His motions and even his vocal sounds showed a restraint and deliberateness highly peculiar in an infant, and no one was really unprepared when at seven months he began to walk unassisted, with falterings which another month was sufficient to remove. It was some time after this time, on Halloween, that a great blaze was seen at midnight on the top of Sentinel Hill, where the old table-like stone stands amidst its tumulus of ancient bones. Considerable talk was started when Silas Bishop, of the undecayed bishops, mentioned having seen the boy running sturdily up that hill ahead of his mother about an hour before the blaze was remarked. Silas was rounding up a stray heifer, but he nearly forgot his mission when he fleetingly spied the two figures in the dim light of his lantern. They darted almost noiselessly through the underbush, and the astonished watcher seemed to think they were entirely unclothed. Afterward, he could not be sure about the boy, who may have had some kind of fringed belt and a pair of dark trunks or trousers on. Wilbur was never subsequently seen alive and conscious without complete and rightly buttoned attire, the disarrangement or threatened disarrangement of which almost seemed to fill him with anger and alarm. His contrast with his squalid mother and grandfather in this respect was thought very notable until the horror of 1928 suggested the most valid of reasons. The next January, gossips were mildly interested in the fact that Lavinie's black brat had commenced to talk, and at the age of only eleven months. His speech was somewhat remarkable, both because of its difference from the ordinary accents of the region, and because it displayed a freedom from infantile lisping, of which many children of three or four might well be proud. He was soon disliked even more decidedly than his mother and grandsire and all conjectures about him were spiced with references to the bygone magic of old Waitley, and how the hills once shook when he shrieked the dreadful name of yog sothoth in the middle of a circle of stones, with a great book open in his arms before him. Dogs abhorred the boy, and he was always obliged to take various defensive measures against their barking menace.
Meanwhile, old Waitley continued to buy cattle without measurably increasing the size of his herd. He also cut timber and began to repair the unused parts of his house, a spacious peak-roofed affair whose rear end was buried entirely in the rocky hillside and whose three least-ruined ground-floor rooms had always been sufficient for himself and his daughter. His mania showed itself only in his tight boarding up of all the windows in the reclaimed section, though many declared that it was a crazy thing to bother with the reclamation at all. Less inexplicable was his fitting up of another downstairs room for his new grandson, a room which several callers saw, though no one was ever admitted to the closely boarded upper story. This chamber he lined with tall, firm shelving, along which he began gradually to arrange, in apparently careful order, all the rotting ancient books and parts of books which during his own day had been heaped promiscuously in odd corners of the various rooms. By this time, the restoration of the house was finished, and those who watched it wondered why one of the upper windows had been made into a solid plank door. It was a window in the rear of the east gable end, close against the hill, and no one could imagine why a cleated wooden runway was built up to it from the ground. About the period of this work's completion, people noticed that the old tool house, tightly locked and windowlessly clabbered since Wilbur's birth, had been abandoned again. The door swung listlessly open, and when Earl Sawyer once stepped within after a cattle-selling call on Old Waitley, he was quite discomposed by the singular odour he encountered. Such a stench, he averred, as he had never before smelt in all his life except near the Indian circles on the hills, and which could not come from anything sane or of this earth. The few callers at the house would often find Lavinia alone on the ground floor, while odd cries and footsteps resounded in the boarded-up second story. She would never tell what her father and the boy were doing up there, though once she turned pale and displayed an abnormal degree of fear when a jocko's fish peddler tried the locked door leading to the stairway. That peddler told the store loungers at Dunwich Village that he thought he heard a horse stamping on the floor above. The loungers reflected, thinking of the door and runway and of the cattle that so swiftly disappeared. Then they shuddered as they recalled tales of old Waitley's youth and of the strange things that are called out of the earth when a bullock is sacrificed at the proper time to certain heathen gods. It had for some time been noticed that dogs had begun to hate and fear the whole Waitley place as violently as they hated and feared young Wilbur personally. In 1917 the war came, and Squire Sawyer Waitley, as chairman of the local draft board, had hard work finding a quota of young Dunwich men fit even to be sent to a development camp. The government, alarmed at such signs of wholesale regional decadence, sent several officers and medical experts to investigate, conducting a survey which New England newspaper readers may still recall. It was the publicity attending this investigation which set reporters on the track of the Waitleys, and caused the Boston Globe and Arkham Advertiser to print flamboyant Sunday stories of young Wilbur's precociousness, old Waitley's black magic, and the shelves of strange books, the sealed second story of the ancient farmhouse, and the weirdness of the whole region and its hill noises. Wilbur was four and a half then, and looked like a lad of fifteen. His lips and cheeks were fuzzy with a coarse, dark down and his voice had begun to break. For a decade, the annals of the Waitleys sink indistinguishably into the general life of a morbid community used to their queer ways and hardened to their May Eve and All Hallows Day. About 1923, when Wilbur was a boy of ten, whose mind, voice, stature and bearded face gave all the impressions of maturity, a second great siege of carpentry went on at the old house. It was all inside the sealed upper part, and from bits of discarded lumber, people concluded that the youth and his grandfather had knocked out all the partitions and even removed the attic floor, leaving only one vast open void between the ground story and the peaked roof. That Halloween, the hill noises sounded louder than ever, and fire burned on Sentinel Hill as usual, but people paid more attention to the rhythmical screaming of vast flocks of unnaturally belated whippoorwills, which seemed to be assembled near the unlighted Waitley farmhouse. 
After midnight, their shrill notes burst into a kind of pandemoniac cachination which filled all the countryside, and not until dawn did they finally quiet down. Then they vanished, hurrying southward where they were fully a month overdue. What this meant, no one could quite be certain till later. None of the country folk seemed to have died. But poor Lavinia Waitley, the twisted albino, was never seen again. The following winter brought an event no less strange than Wilbur's first trip outside the Dunwich region. Correspondence with the Widener Library at Harvard, the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, the British Museum, the University of Buenos Aires and the Library of Miskatonic University at Arkham had failed to get him the loan of a book he desperately wanted. So at length he set out in person, shabby, dirty, bearded and uncouth of dialect, to consult the copy at Miskatonic which was the nearest to him geographically. Almost eight feet tall, and carrying a cheap new valise from Osborne's general store, this dark and goatish gargoyle appeared one day in Arkham in quest of the dreaded volume kept under lock and key at the college library, the hideous Necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul al Hazred, in Aulawus Wormius Latin version as printed in Spain in the 17th century. Wilbur had with him the priceless but imperfect copy of Dr. D's English version, which his grandfather had bequeathed him, and upon receiving access to the Latin copy, he at once began to collate the two texts, with the aim of discovering a certain passage which would have come on the 751st page of his own defective volume. This much he could not civilly refrain from telling the librarian. The same erudite Henry Armitage, Master of Arts Miskatonic, Doctor of Philosophy Princeton, Doctor of Literature John Hopkins, who had once called at the farm, and who now politely plied him with questions. He was looking, he had to admit, for a kind of formula or incantation containing the frightful name Yog sothoth and it puzzled him to find discrepancies, duplications and ambiguities which made the matter of determination far from easy. As he copied the formula he finally chose, Dr. Armitage looked involuntarily over his shoulder at the open pages, the left-hand one of which, in the Latin version, contains such monstrous threats to the peace and sanity of the world. Nor is it to be thought, ran the text as Armitage mentally translated it, that man is either the oldest or the last of earth's masters, or that the common bulk of life and substance walks alone. The old ones were, the old ones are, and the old ones shall be, not in the spaces we know, but between them. They walk serene and primal, undimensioned, and to us, unseen. yog -Sothoth knows the gate. yog -Sothoth is the gate. yog -Sothoth is the key and guardian of the gate. Past, present, future, all are one in yog -Sothoth. He knows where the old ones broke through of old, and where they shall break through again. He knows where they have trod earth's fields, and where they still tread them, and why no one can behold them as they tread. By their smell can men sometimes know them near, but of their semblance can no man know, saving only in the features of those they have begotten on mankind. And of those are there many sorts differing in likeness from man's truest eidolon to that shape without sight or substance which is them. They walk unseen and foul in lonely places where the words have been spoken and the rites howled through at their seasons. The wind gibbers with their voices and the earth mutters with their consciousness. They bend the forest and crush the city, yet may not forest or city behold the hand that smites. Kadath. In the cold waste hath known them, and what man knows Kadath? The ice desert of the south, and the sunken isles of ocean hold stones whereon their seal is engraven. But who hath seen the deep frozen city, or the sealed tower long garlanded with seaweed and barnacles? Great Cthulhu is their cousin, yet can he spy them only dimly. Ya Shob Nigorath, as a foulness shall ye know them. Their hand is at your throats, yet ye see them not, and their habitation is even one with your guarded threshold. yog -Sothoth is the key to the gate, whereby the spheres meet. Man rules now where they ruled once, 
They shall soon rule where man rules now. After summer is winter, and after winter, summer. They wait patient and potent, for here shall they reign again. Dr. Armitage, associating what he was reading with what he had heard of Dunwich and its brooding presences, and of Wilbur Waitley and his dim, hideous aura that stretched from a dubious birth to a cloud of probable matricide, felt a wave of fright as tangible as a draught of the tomb's cold clamminess. The bent, goatish giant before him seemed like the spawn of another planet or dimension, like something only partly of mankind and linked to black gulfs of essence and entity that stretch like titan phantasms beyond all spheres of force and matter, space and time. Presently Wilbur raised his head and began speaking in that strange, resonant fashion which hinted at sound-producing organs unlike the run of mankind's. Mr. Armitage, he said, I calculate I've got to take that book home. There's things in it I've got to try under certain conditions that I can't get here. And it would be a mortal sin to let a red tape rule hold me up. Let me take it along, sir, and I swear there won't nobody know the difference. I don't need to tell you I'll take good care of it. It weren't me that put this decopy in the shape it is. He stopped as he saw firm denial on the librarian's face, and his own goatish features grew crafty. Armitage, half ready to tell him he might take a copy of what parts he needed, thought suddenly of the possible consequences and checked himself. There was too much responsibility in giving such a being the key to such blasphemous outer spheres. Waitley saw how things stood and tried to answer lightly. Well, all right if you feel that way about it. Maybe Harvard won't be so fussy as you be. And without saying more, he rose and strode out of the building, stooping at each doorway. During the ensuing weeks, Armitage set about to collect all possible data on Wilbur Whateley and the formless presences around Dunwich. A visit to Dunwich Village had failed to bring out much that was new, but a close survey of the Necronomicon in those parts which Wilbur had sought so avidly, seemed to supply new and terrible clues to the nature, methods and desires of the strange evil so vaguely threatening this planet. Talks with several students of archaic lore in Boston and letters to many others elsewhere gave him a growing amazement which passed slowly through varied degrees of alarm to a state of really acute spiritual fear. As the summer drew on, he felt dimly that something ought to be done about the lurking terrors of the upper Miskatonic Valley and about the monstrous being known to the human world as Wilbur Whateley. The Dunwich horror itself came between Lammas and the Equinox in 1928, and Dr. Armitage was among those who witnessed its monstrous prologue. He had heard, meanwhile, of Waitley's grotesque trip to Cambridge and of his frantic efforts to borrow or copy from the Necronomicon at the Widner Library. Those efforts had been in vain, since Armitage had issued warnings of the keenest intensity to all librarians having charge of the dreaded volume. Wilbur had been shockingly nervous at Cambridge, anxious for the book, yet almost equally anxious to get home again, as if he feared the results of being away long. Early in August, the half-expected outcome developed, and in the small hours of the third, Dr. Armitage was awakened suddenly by the wild, fierce cries of the savage watchdog on the college campus. Deep and terrible, the snarling, half-mad growls and barks continued. All was in mounting volume, but with hideously significant pauses. Then there rang out a scream from a wholly different throat, such a scream as roused half the sleepers of Arkham and haunted their dreams ever afterward such a scream as could come from no being born of earth, or wholly of earth. Armitage hastened into some clothing and rushed across the street and lawn to the college buildings, saw that others were ahead of him, and heard the echoes of a burglar alarm still shrilling from the library. 
An open window showed black and gaping in the moonlight. What had come had indeed completed its entrance, for the barking and the screaming, now fast fading into a mixed low growling and moaning, proceeded unmistakably from within. Some instinct warned Armitage that what was taking place was not a thing for unfortified eyes to see. So he brushed back the crowd with authority as he unlocked the vestibule door. Among the others he saw Professor Warren Rice and Dr. Francis Morgan, men to whom he had told some of his conjectures and misgivings, and these two he motioned to accompany him inside. The inward sounds, except for a watchful droning whine from the dog, had by this time quite subsided. But Armitage now perceived with a sudden start that a loud chorus of whippoorwills among the shrubbery had commenced a damnably rhythmical piping as if in unison with the last breaths of a dying man. The building was full of a frightful stench, which Dr. Armitage knew too well, and the three men rushed across the hall to the small genealogical reading room whence the low whining came. For a second nobody dared to turn on the light. Then Armitage summoned up his courage and snapped the switch. One of the three, it's not certain which, shrieked aloud at what sprawled before them among disordered tables and overturned chairs. Professor Rice declares that he wholly lost consciousness for an instant, though he did not stumble or fall. The thing that lay half-bent on its side in a fetid pool of greenish-yellow ichor and tarry stickiness was almost nine feet tall, and the dog had torn off all the clothing and some of the skin. It was not quite dead, but twitched silently and spasmodically while its chest heaved in monstrous unison with the mad piping of the expectant whippoorwills outside. Bits of shoe leather and fragments of apparel were scattered about the room, and just inside the window an empty canvas sack lay where it had evidently been thrown. Near the central desk a revolver had fallen, a dented but undischarged cartridge later explaining why it had not been fired. The thing itself, however, crowded out all other images at the time. It would be trite and not wholly accurate to say that no human pen could describe it, but one may properly say that it could not be vividly visualized by anyone whose ideas of aspect and contour are too closely bound up with the common life forms of this planet and of the three known dimensions. It was partly human, beyond a doubt, with very manlike hands and head, and the goatish chinless face had the stamp of the Whateleys upon it, but the torso and lower parts of the body were teratologically fabulous, so that only generous clothing could ever have enabled it to walk on earth unchallenged or uneradicated. Above the waist it was semi-anthropomorphic, though its chest, where the dog's rending paws still rested watchfully, had the leathery reticulated hide of a crocodile or alligator. The back was piebald, with yellow and black, and dimly suggested the squamous covering of certain snakes. Below the waist, though, it was the worst. For here all human resemblance left off and sheer fantasy began. The skin was thickly covered with coarse black fur, and from the abdomen a score of long greenish-grey tentacles with red sucking mouths protruded limply. Their arrangement was odd, and seemed to follow the symmetries of some cosmic geometry unknown to Earth or the solar system. On each of the hips, deep set in a kind of pinkish, ciliated orbit, was what seemed to be a rudimentary eye, whilst in lieu of a tail there depended a kind of trunk or feeler with purple annular markings, and with many evidences of being an undeveloped mouth or throat. The limbs save for their black fur, roughly resembled the hind legs of prehistoric Earth's giant saurians, and terminated in ridgy-veined pads that were neither hooves nor claws. When the thing breathed, its tail and tentacles rhythmically changed colour, as if from some circulatory cause normal to the non-human side of its ancestry. In the tentacles this was observable as a deepening of the greenish tinge, whilst in the tail it was manifest as a yellowish appearance, which alternated with a sickly greyish white in the spaces between the purple rings. Of genuine blood there was none, only the fetid greenish-yellow ichor which trickled along the painted floor beyond the radius of the stickiness, and left a curious discoloration behind it. As the presence of the three men seemed to rouse the dying thing, 
It began to mumble without turning or raising its head. Dr. Armitage made no written record of its mouthings, but asserts confidently that nothing in English was uttered. At first the syllables defied all correlation with any speech of earth, but towards the last there came some disjointed fragments evidently taken from the Necronomicon, that monstrous blasphemy in quest of which the thing had perished. These fragments, as Armitage recalls them, ran something like Nagai, Nagara, Borjagorreha, Yogsathoth, Yogsathoth. They trailed off into nothingness as the whippoorwills shrieked in rhythmical crescendos of unholy anticipation. Then came a halt in the gasping, and the dog raised its head in a long, lugubrious howl. A change came over the yellow, goatish face of the prostrate thing, and the great black eyes fell in appallingly. Outside the window, the shrilling of the whippoorwills had suddenly ceased, and above the murmurs of the gathering crowd there came the sound of panic-struck whirring and fluttering, Against the moon, vast clouds of feathery watchers rose and raced from sight, frantic at that which they had sought for prey. Meanwhile, frightful changes were taking place on the floor. One need not describe the kind and rate of shrinkage and disintegration that occurred before the eyes of Dr. Armitage and Professor Rice, but it is permissible to say that aside from the external appearance of face and hands, the really human element in Wilbur Waitley must have been very small. When the medical examiner came, there was only a sticky, whitish mass on the painted boards, and the monstrous odour had nearly disappeared. Apparently, Waitley had no skull or bony skeleton, at least in any true or stable sense. He had taken somewhat after his unknown father. Yet all this was only the prologue of the actual Dunwich horror. Formalities were gone through by bewildered officials, abnormal details were duly kept from press and public, and men were sent to Dunwich and Aylesbury to look up property and notify any who might be heirs of the late Wilbur Whateley. They found the countryside in great agitation, both because of the growing rumblings beneath the domed hills, and because of the unwanted stench and the surging, lapping sounds which came increasingly from the great empty shell formed by Whateley's boarded-up farmhouse. Earl Sawyer who tended the horse and cattle during Wilbur's absence, had developed a woefully acute case of nerves. The officials devised excuses not to enter the noisome, boarded place, and were glad to confine their survey of the deceased's living quarters, the newly mended sheds, to a single visit. They filed a ponderous report at the courthouse in Aylesbury, and litigations concerning airship are said to be still in progress among the innumerable Waitleys, decayed and undecayed of the upper Miskatonic Valley. It was in the dark of September 9th that the horror broke loose. The hill noises had been very pronounced during the evening and dogs barked frantically all night. Early risers on the 10th noticed a peculiar stench in the air. About seven o'clock, Luther Brown, the hired boy at George Corey's between Cold Spring Glen and the village, rushed frenziedly back from his morning trip to Ten Acre Meadow with the cows he was almost convulsed with fright as he stumbled into the kitchen, and in the yard outside the no less frightened herd were pawing and lowing pitifully, having followed the boy back in the panic they shared with him. Between gasps, Luther tried to stammer out his tale to Mrs. Corey. Out there in the rod beyond the glen, Miss Corey, there's southern bend there. It smells like thunder and all the bushes and little trees is pushed back from the rod like there's a house been moved along it. And that ain't the worst neither. There's prints in the rod, Miss Corey, great round prints as big as barrel heads, all sunk down like an elephant had been along. Only there's a sight more than a four feet could make. I looked at one or two before I run, I see that one was covered with lines spreading out from one place, like as if big palm leaf fans, twice or three times as big as they, had been pounded down into the rod. And the smell was awful, like what is around Wizard Waitley's old house. By that noon, Fully three-quarters of the men and boys of Dunwich were trooping over the roads and meadows between the new-made Waitley ruins and Cold Spring Glen, examining in horror the vast, monstrous prints, the maimed bishop cattle, the strange, noisome wreck of the farmhouse, and the bruised, matted vegetation of the fields and roadsides. Whatever had burst loose upon the world had assuredly gone down into the great sinister ravine, 
for all the trees on the banks were bent and broken, and a great avenue had been gouged in the precipice-hanging underbrush. It was as though a house, launched by an avalanche, had slid down through the tangled growths of the almost vertical slope. From below, no sound came, but only a distant, undefinable feeter. And it is not to be wondered at that the men preferred to stay on the edge and argue rather than descend and beard the unknown Cyclopean horror in its lair. Three dogs that were with the party had barked furiously at first, but seemed cowed and reluctant when near the glen. Someone telephoned the news to the Aylesbury transcript, but the editor, accustomed to wild tales from Dunwich, did no more than concoct a humorous paragraph about it, an item soon afterward reproduced by the Associated Press. The next day, all the countryside was in a panic, and cowed, uncommunicative groups came and went where the fiendish thing had occurred. Two titan swaths of destruction stretched from the glen to the Fry farmyard. Monstrous prints covered the bare patches of ground, and one side of the old red barn had completely caved in. Of the cattle, only a quarter could be found and identified. Some of these were in curious fragments, and all that survived had to be shot. Earl Sawyer suggested that help be asked from Aylesbury or Arkham, but others maintained it would be of no use. Old Zebulon Waitley, of a branch that hovered about halfway between soundness and decadence, made darkly wild suggestions about rites that ought to be practised on the hilltops. He came of a line where tradition ran strong, and his memories of chantings in the great stone circles were not altogether connected with Wilbur and his grandfather. Thursday night began much like the others, but it ended less happily. The whippoorwills in the glen had screamed with such unusual persistence that many could not sleep, and about 3 a.m. all the party telephones rang tremulously. Those who took down their receiver heard a fright-mad voice shriek out, Help! Oh, my God! And some thought a crashing sound followed the breaking off of the exclamation. There was nothing more. No one dared do anything, and no one knew till morning whence the call came. Then those who had heard it called everyone on the line and found that only the Fries did not reply. The truth appeared an hour later when a hastily assembled group of armed men trudged out to the Fry place at the head of the glen. It was horrible, yet hardly a surprise. There were more swaths and monstrous prints, but there was no longer any house. It had caved in like an eggshell, and amongst the ruins nothing living or dead could be discovered. Only a stench and a tarry stickiness. The Elmer Fries had been erased from Dunwich. In the meantime, a quieter yet even more spiritually poignant phase of the horror had been blackly unwinding itself behind the closed door of a shelf-lined room in Arkham. The curious manuscript record, or diary, of Wilbur Waitley, delivered to Miskatonic University for translation, had caused much worry and bafflement among the experts in languages both ancient and modern. Its very alphabet, notwithstanding a general resemblance to the heavily shaded Arabic used in Mesopotamia, being absolutely unknown to any available authority. The final conclusion of the linguists was that the text represented an artificial alphabet, giving the effect of a cipher, though none of the usual methods of cryptographic solution seemed to furnish any clue, even when applied on the basis of every tongue the writer might conceivably have used. The ancient books taken from Waitley's quarters, while absorbing the interesting and in several cases promising to open up new and terrible lines of research among philosophers and men of science, were of no assistance whatever in this matter. One of them, a heavy tome with an iron clasp, was in another unknown alphabet, this one of a very different caste, and resembling Sanskrit more than anything else. The old ledger was at length given wholly into the charge of Dr. Armitage, both because of his peculiar interest in the Waitley matter and because of his wide linguistic learning and skill in the mystical formulae of antiquity and the Middle Ages. Armitage had an idea that the alphabet might be something esoterically used by certain forbidden cults which have come down from old times and which have inherited many forms and traditions from the wizards of the Saracenic world. That question, however, he did not deem vital. 
since it would be unnecessary to know the origin of the symbols if, as he suspected, they were used as a cipher in a modern language. It was his belief that considering the great amount of text involved, the writer would scarcely have wished the trouble of using another speech than his own, save perhaps in certain special formulae and incantations. Accordingly, he attacked the manuscript with a preliminary assumption that the bulk of it was in English. Dr. Armitage knew, from the repeated failures of his colleagues, that the riddle was a deep and complex one, and that no simple mode of solution could merit even a trial. All through late August he fortified himself with the mass law of cryptography, drawing upon the fullest resources of his own library. On the evening of September 2nd, the last major barrier gave way, and Dr. Armitage read for the first time a continuous passage of Wilbur Whateley's annals. It was, in truth, a diary, as all had thought and it was couched in a style clearly showing the mixed occult erudition and general illiteracy of the strange being who wrote it. Almost the first long passage that Armitage deciphered, an entry dated November the 26th, 1916, proved highly startling and disquieting. It was written, he remembered, by a child of three and a half who looked like a lad of twelve or thirteen. Today learn the Aklo for the Sabaoth, it ran which did not like, it being answerable from the hill and not from the air. That upstairs more ahead of me than I had thought it would be, and is not like to have much earth brain. Grandfather kept me saying the dough formula last night, and I think I saw the inner city at the two magnetic poles. I shall go to these poles when the earth is cleared off. That upstairs looks it will have the right cast. I can see it a little when I make the voorish signs or blow the powder of Ibn Ghazi at it. And it is near like them at May Eve on the hill. The other face may wear off some. I wonder how I shall look when the earth is cleared and there are no earth beings on it. He that came with the Aklos about said I may be transfigured, there being much of outside to work on. Morning found Dr. Armitage in a cold sweat of terror and a frenzy of wakeful concentration. He had not left the manuscript all night, but sat at his table under the electric light, turning page after page with shaking hands as fast as he could decipher the cryptic text. Sometime before noon, his physician, Dr. Hartwell, called to see him and insisted that he cease work. He refused, intimating that it was of the most vital importance for him to complete the reading of the diary and promising an explanation in due course of time. Dr. Armitage slept, but was partly delirious the next day. Stop them! Stop them! he would shout. Those Waitleys meant to let them in, and the worst of all is left. Tell Rice and Morgan we must do something. It's a blind business, but I know how to make the powder. It hasn't been fed since the 2nd of August, when Wilbur came here to his death, and at that rate... But Armitage had a sound physique, despite his 73 years, and slept off his disorder that night without developing any real fever. He woke late Friday, clear of head, though sober with a gnawing fear and a tremendous sense of responsibility. Saturday afternoon he felt able to go over to the library and summon Rice and Morgan for a conference, and the rest of that day and evening the three men tortured their brains in the wildest speculation and the most desperate debate. Strange and terrible books were drawn voluminously from the stack shelves and from secure places of storage and diagrams and formulae were copied with feverish haste and in bewildering abundance. Of scepticism there was none. All three had seen the body of Wilbur Whateley as it lay on the floor in a room of that very building, and after that not one of them could feel even slightly inclined to treat the diary as a madman's raving. Friday morning, Armitage, Rice and Morgan set out by motor for Dunwich, arriving at the village about one in the afternoon. The day was pleasant. 
but even in the brightest sunlight a kind of quiet dread and portent seemed to hover about the strangely domed hills and the deep shadowy ravines of the stricken region. Now and then on some mountain top a gaunt circle of stones could be glimpsed against the sky. At length the visitors, apprised of a party of state police which had come from Aylesbury that morning in response to the first telephone reports of the Fry tragedy, decided to seek out the officers and compare notes as far as practicable. This, however, they found more easily planned than performed, since no sign of the party could be found in any direction. There had been five of them in a car, but now the car stood empty near the ruins in the fry yard. The natives, all of whom had talked with the policemen, seemed at first as perplexed as Armitage and his companions. Then old Sam Hutchins thought of something and turned pale, nudging Fred Farr and pointing to the dank, deep hollow that yawned close by. God, he gasped. I told him not to go down into the glen, and I never thought nobody would do it with them tracks and the smell and the whippoorwills are screeching down there in the dark of noonday. A cold shudder ran through natives and visitors alike, and every ear seemed strained in a kind of instinctive, unconscious listening. Armitage, now that he had actually come upon the horror and its monstrous work, trembled with the responsibility he felt to be his. Night would soon fall, and it was then that the mountainous blasphemy lumbered upon its eldritch course. Negotium perambulans in tenebris. The old librarian rehearsed the formula he had memorized, and clutched the paper containing the alternative one he had not memorized. He saw that his electric flashlight was in working order. Rice, beside him, took from a valise a metal sprayer of the sort used in combating insects, whilst Morgan uncased the big-game rifle on which he relied, despite his colleagues' warnings that no material weapon would be of help. There were rumblings under the hills that night, and the whippoorwills piped threateningly. Once in a while a wind sweeping up out of Cold Spring Glen would bring a touch of ineffable fetor to the heavy night air, such a fetor as all three of the watchers had smelled once before, when they stood above a dying thing that had passed for fifteen years and a half as a human being. But the looked-for terror did not appear. Whatever was down there in the glen was biding its time, and Armitage told his colleagues it would be suicidal to try to attack it in the dark. Morning came wanly, and the night sounds ceased. It was a grey, bleak day, with now and then a drizzle of rain, and heavier and heavier clouds seemed to be piling themselves up beyond the hills to the northwest. It was still gruesomely dark when, not much over an hour later, a confused babble of voices sounded down the road. Another moment brought to view a frightened group of more than a dozen men, running, shouting, and even whimpering hysterically. Someone in the lead began sobbing out words, and the Arkham men started violently when those words developed a coherent form. Oh, my God! My God! the voice choked out. It's a goin' again, and this time by day! It's out, it's out, and I'm moving this very minute, and only the Lord knows when it'll be on us all. The speaker panted into silence, but another took up his message. That's all. Not a sound nor squeak over the phone out of that. Just still like. We that heard it got out Fords and wagons and rounded up as many able-bodied men folk as we could get at Corey's place and come up here to see what you thought best to do. Not but what I think it's the Lord's judgment for our iniquities that no mortal kin ever set aside. Armitage saw that the time for positive action had come and spoke decisively to the faltering group of frightened rustics. We must follow it, boys. He made his voice as reassuring as possible. I believe there's a chance of putting it out of business. You men know that those Waitleys were wizards. Well, this is a thing of wizardry and must be put down by the same means. I've seen Wilbur Waitley's diary and read some of the strange old books he used to read. I think I know the right kind of spell to recite to make the thing fade away. Of course, one can't be sure, but we can always take a chance. It's invisible. I knew it would be. But there's powder in this long-distance sprayer that might make it show up for a second. Later on, we'll try it. It's a frightful thing to have alive, but it isn't as bad as what Wilbur would have let in if he'd lived longer. You'll never know what the world escaped. Now, we've only this one thing to fight, and it can't multiply. It can, though, do a lot of harm. So we mustn't hesitate to rid the community of it. 
We must follow it, and the way to begin is to go to the place that has just been wrecked. Let somebody lead the way. I don't know your roads very well, but I have an idea there might be a shorter cut across lots. Well, how about it? The men shuffled about a moment, and then Earl Sawyer spoke softly, pointing with a grimy finger through the steadily lessening rain. I guess you can get to Seth Bishop's quickest by cutting across the lower meadow here, wading the brook at the low place and climbing through Carrier's Mowen and the timber lot beyond. That comes out on the upper rud, mighty nigh Seth's, a little to other side. As the men passed the site of Wilbur Waitley's abode, they shuddered visibly, and seemed again to mix hesitancy with their zeal. It was no joke tracking down something as big as a house that one could not see, but that had all the vicious malevolence of a demon. Opposite the base of Sentinel Hill, the tracks left the road, and there was a fresh bending and matting visible along the broad swath, marking the monster's former route to and from the summit. In the end, the three men from Arkham, old white-bearded Dr. Armitage, stocky, iron-grey Professor Rice, and lean, youngish Dr. Morgan ascended the mountain alone. After much patient instruction regarding its focusing and use, they left the telescope with the frightened group that remained in the road. Curtis Waitley was holding the telescope when the Arkham party detoured radically from the swath. He told the crowd that the men were evidently trying to get to a subordinate peak which overlooked the swath at a point considerably ahead of where the shrubbery was now bending. Then he cried out that Armitage was adjusting the sprayer which Rice held and that something must be about to happen. The crowd stirred uneasily, recalling that his sprayer was expected to give the unseen horror a moment of visibility. Curtis, who held the instrument, dropped it with a piercing shriek into the ankle-deep mud of the road. He reeled and would have crumpled to the ground had not two or three others seized and steadied him. All he could do was moan half inaudibly. Oh, oh, great God, that, that, bigger in a barn, all made of squirming ropes. Whole thing sort of shaped like a hen's egg bigger than anything with dozens of legs like hogs' heads that half shut up when they step. Nothing solid about it. All like jelly and made of separate wriggling ropes pushed close together. Great bulging eyes all over it. Ten or twenty mouths or trunks are sticking out all along the side. Bigger stovepipes and all a tossing and opening and shutting all grey with kind of blue or purple rings and god in heaven that half face on top this final memory whatever it was proved too much for poor curtis and he collapsed completely before he could say more the whippoorwills continued their irregular pulsation and the men of Dunwich braced themselves tensely against some imponderable menace with which the atmosphere seemed surcharged. Without warning came those deep, cracked, raucous vocal sounds which will never leave the memory of the stricken group who heard them. Not from any human throat were they born, for the organs of man can yield no such acoustic perversions. Rather, one would have said they came from the pit itself, had not their source been so unmistakably the altar stone on the peak. It is almost erroneous to call them sounds at all, since so much of their ghastly infra-base timbre spoke to dim seats of consciousness and terror far subtler than the ear. Yet one must do so, since their form was indisputably, though vaguely that of half-articulate words. They were loud, loud as the rumblings and the thunder above which they echoed. Yet did they come from no visible being? and because imagination might suggest a conjectural source in the world of non-visible beings, the huddled crowd at the mountain's base huddled still closer and winced as if in expectation of a blow. was all. 
the pallid group in the road still reading at the indisputably English syllables that had poured thickly and thunderously down from the frantic vacancy beside that shocking altar stone, were never to hear such syllables again. Instead, they jumped violently at the terrific report which seemed to rend the hills, the deafening cataclysmic appeal whose source, be it inner earth or sky, no hero was ever able to place. A single lightning bolt shot from the purple zenith to the altar stone, and a great tidal wave of viewless force and indescribable stench swept down from the hill to all the countryside. The stench left quickly, but the vegetation never came right again. To this day there is something queer and unholy about the growths on and around that fearsome hill. Curtis Waitley was only just regaining consciousness when the Arkham men came slowly down the mountain in the beams of a sunlight once more brilliant and untainted. The thing has gone forever, Armitage said. It has been split up into what it was originally made of and can never exist again. It was an impossibility in a normal world. Only the least fraction was really matter in any sense we know. It was like its father, and most of it has gone back to him in some vague realm or dimension outside our material universe. Some vague abyss out of which only the most accursed rites of human blasphemy could ever have called him for a moment on the hills. There was a brief silence. And in that pause, the scattered senses of poor Curtis Waitley began to knit back into a sort of continuity, so that he put his hands to his head with a moan. Memory seemed to pick itself up where it had left off, and the horror of the sight that had prostrated him burst in upon him again. Oh, my God, that half-face, that half-face on top of it. That face with the red eyes and crinkly albino hair and no chin like the Waitley's. It was an octopus, centipede, spider kind of thing, but there was a half-shaped man's face on top of it, and it looked like Wizard Waitley, only it was yards and yards across. Zebel and Waitley, who wanderingly remembered ancient things, but who had been silent heretofore, spoke aloud. Fifteen years gone, he rambled. I heard old Wetley say as how some day we'd hear a child of Lavinia's a calling its father's name the top of Sentinel Hill. But Joe Osborne interrupted him to question the Arkham men anew. What was it, anyhow? And however did young wizard Wakeley call it out of the air it come from? Armitage chose his words very carefully. It was... Well, it was mostly a kind of force that doesn't belong in our part of space. A kind of force that acts and grows and shapes itself by other laws than those of our sort of nature. We have no business calling in such things from outside, and only very wicked people and very wicked cults ever try to. There was some of it in Wilbur Waitley himself, enough to make a devil and a precocious monster of him, and to make his passing out a pretty terrible sight. I'm going to burn his accursed diary, and if you men are wise, you'll dynamite that altar stone up there and pull down all the rings of standing stones on the other hills. Things like that brought down the beings those Waitleys were so fond of. The beings they were going to let in, tangibly to wipe out the human race and drag the earth off to some nameless place for some nameless purpose. But as to this thing we've just sent back, the Waitleys raised it for a terrible part in the doings that were to come. It grew fast and big from the same reason that Wilbur grew fast and big. But it beat him because it had a greater share of the outsideness in it. Uh, you needn't ask how Wilbur called it out of the air. He didn't call it out. It was his twin brother, but it looked more like the father than he did. <laughs>